Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, Chucky2009, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking about warpage. I'll take a few minutes, just talk about what it is, and I'll give you guys some tips that'll hopefully help you out in your future welding endeavors. So first off, what is warpage? Uh, well, let's take a look at this fine piece of three-quarter inch plate, or what's left of it. It was a lot bigger when I got it, but I mean, this is what I used when I severed test plasma cutters. But anyway, let's say you take a piece of metal like this, and, uh, and you have a way to evenly heat it, like completely perfectly even, all the way through, and that's what you do. It would expand evenly in every direction, and then assuming that it could cool evenly, it would shrink evenly in every direction, and it would come out not looking a whole lot different than it is now. But the problem is when you weld something, you're not heating it evenly. You're only heating, you know, the tiny little section, which is right where you're welding, and then immediately around your weld, and uh, because of that, you don't have even expansion of the metal, and then you don't have even shrinkage of the metal, and then you're left with something that's all twisted and mangled. Maybe not that twisted and mangled. A lot of it's going to come down to what you're working on. Thinner material and certain joint configurations are especially susceptible to warpage, more so than other things, but more on that later. Alright, so that, in a nutshell, is uh, what warpage is and how it happens. So our first step of the night, our first uh, tip of the night, is going to be to backstep your welds, and... What I have here is a T-joint made up of 2 inch by 8 inch flat bar stock and I'm just going to show you this as opposed to standing here talking about it. Let's come over here take a look at this joint. Now when you back step a weld what you do is instead of starting here and welding your way all the way across this joint at once you only weld in sections of it and you uh, sort of rear end the last weld here for lack of a better term. And in doing so, you spread out the heat a little bit better. For instance, if I were going to weld this all at once, what would happen is, as I weld, we build more heat, and now it just keeps spreading out and keeps spreading out all across our material. But if we stagger our welds a little bit, I guess that's not the right word, but if we, uh, you know, backstep our welds here, we'd start here, and the heat would only spread out a little bit before we stop. And then we come back here, spreads out just a little bit more, and uh, what we're doing is controlling how much our heat kind of spreads out from immediately around the weld. At least that's how I'd describe it. Now, and just for the record here, uh, let me add in that I don't officially recommend using tack welds like this to mark out your back step simply because, well, I mean, I guess it's one thing if you're using thicker material and a really hot welding process and they're small tack welds, but the way I have it set up here, I will probably just have a bunch of cold starts. I use the tack welds because they're pretty easy to see on camera. Now one thing to keep in mind is if you're going to make or TIG something, you don't really have to worry about that much uh, smoke, so you can usually get away with using soapstone or one of these silver pencils here that I like, but if you're going to be doing something that throws a lot of smoke, like stick welding, like what we're going to be doing, or uh, flux core welding, you might just um, weld right over your mark because you never even saw it, been there, done that. And so what I do is I take an, a uh, unburnt stick electrode stub and I put it down there because that you'll see as you're approaching it. So just thought I'd add that. Let's do this. So real quick, one more time before we do this. Start here and here. Start here, weld to the beginning of the weld you just did. Start here, weld to the beginning of the weld you just did all the way down the joint. Now let's do this, and just for the record, this will be 88 amps on DC electrode positive. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a basic crash course in how you backstep a weld. So as you can see, this is some pretty thin material here we're working with. We have really no real warpage to speak of. It's still nice and straight, it's still nice and flat. Now another thing you want to keep in mind is you're going to want to tack the crap out of whatever it is that you're working on. Use a lot of tack welds because there's few things worse than welding this part of your project and then getting over to the other side of your project and realizing that it moved because you didn't really tack it up as well as you should. I mean think of it this way, what better way to hold the parts of your project in place 
than to use your project to hold the parts of your project in place. Tack welds are definitely your friends. So, all right, moving on here, jump around, you know, move around whatever it is that you're welding on. Uh, for instance, if I was gonna take a flat piece of diamond tread sheet metal and weld it to a frame made of angle iron, for instance, I would wanna weld a little bit up over here, and a little bit down in this general area, maybe get this corner and in the middle of this side here, just move all over the place. That way, you put a small amount of heat into any one specific area while you're welding there, and then you let that cool as you weld in another area. And what this does is it works to spread out the heat over your entire project and uh, you know keep you from putting all the heat into one specific area. Kind of like the backstepping and kind of like everything else I'm gonna show you guys. Next up, we're gonna be talking about intermittent welds. Now, what is an in intermittent weld? It is when you weld the entirety of a joint without welding the entirety of the joint. Let me show you guys. This is another example piece I ran up, I ran here tonight, made up. It's some um, two inch by eighth inch flat bar stock. And man, this camera's so weird. When I move this way, I see everything go that way and vice versa, so yeah, give me a little time. As you can see, I have welded two thirds of this side and the remaining third of this side. Thus, I have welded the entirety of the joint without welding the entirety of the joint. Now, as you can imagine, uh, if, what, if whatever you're working on is a very strength critical application, uh, this is probably not a good idea. However, if you're fabricating stuff out of sheet metal and it doesn't need to be that strong as in fully welded, very good thing to keep in mind. So, uh, yeah, the other thing you can do is do this, wait for it to cool, and then weld in the remaining gaps here. Another thing to keep in mind. Definitely a good thing to know. Next up, used clamps. Um, followed by, use more clamps, followed by, go out and buy some clamps and use them too. Basically, if you prevent something from moving, it won't move. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. If there's any way you can clamp something so it's not gonna warp, that's a very good thing to do. For instance, if you can imagine this being a piece of square tubing, and I was gonna weld this in the middle of it, these two ends would bow up. I mean, it would literally look like a big bow like this. Maybe not that exaggerated, but it would be noticeable and it would be potentially a problem. Ask me how I know. However, if you were to use clamps on this piece of square tube to clamp this end to the table and this end to the table, you can minimize that. It doesn't work with everything. It won't keep you from twisting a big sheet of sheet metal. I mean, it might protect the edges a little bit, but that's not gonna do anything for the center of it. However, in a lot of applications, you can do a lot to prevent warpage simply by using a lot of clamps. So next up, believe it or not, you can use warpage for good. Granted, I've never seen a thread online of anyone that's like, I warped the crap out of this thing that I'm working on and I'm totally thrilled about it. Uh, just keep in mind that when you weld on one side of something, it'll get pulled over. For instance, if I did attack the back of this plate, the back of this T-joint here, and I welded down this side, this vertical member would pull towards the weld that I just made. Sounds bad, but think about it. If I tacked it up and it wasn't exactly square, kind of like this isn't exactly square. Yeah, if I tacked it up and it was off by a little bit, I could weld the opposite side and there's a chance that'll pull it back into being square. It's not always the extreme effect you need to uh, get things into the squareness they need to be in. However, you know, something to keep in mind if you look at something and you're like, well, it's almost square, but it's not, and you know, just weld that side first. Sometimes you can get away with it. So anyway, these are my crash tips here, my crash course tips. And uh, but the main thing you need to keep in mind is first on our list, and that is just watch your temperature. When you're welding along, and you can tell that whatever it is that you're welding on is getting way too hot. I mean, you can tell by the way the puddle runs, you can you might start to see that you're getting a little bit of undercut, especially when you're welding vertical or somewhat overhead. You know, just stop and let your plate cool down. That's, that's really what it boils down to. The few things that I've majorly warped and had to fix have all been because I kind of got carried away, except for that square tubing example I gave you guys earlier. So, I don't think I fixed that one though. <laughs> anyway, I hope this video has helped you guys out. And as always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more. Have a nice night, everyone. Yeehaw.